Well, I was born in, uh, in Egypt in 1948 uh, in the city of Alexandria. Uh, but I'll say immediately, although with great sorrow, I'm not an Egyptian. A lot of people assume automatically that if you're born in Egypt, you're Egyptian. The sad thing about Egypt is that you're always a non-Egyptian if you're not by blood, which is a problem, but never mind. I'm born from a family uh, of my father's side were Belgians. They immigrated to Egypt in the 1890s and my mother's side Maltese. Uh, Alexandria had a very, very large foreign community, about a quarter of a million in the, uh, the post-war, in the 1940s, 50s. Big cosmopolitan city. It has always been a cosmopolitan city uh, from the day of its foundation by Alexander the Great. But it regenerated itself in the, uh, the pre-war days, uh, mainly because of the establishment of the modern Egyptian state after the Napoleonic invasion. And uh, <coughs> many, many foreigners came to settle there. I'm three generations in Egypt. And uh, so I grew up there and uh, went to school there and went to an English school. I left when I was 19. And I went to England. I first with a little stop in Switzerland, where my brother was living. And I came to complete my studies, uh, which took me till 1973. Uh, in those days, in my family, you either became an architect or an engineer. It was the route that we took. Uh, I decided to go into construction engineering. I did it at the uh, South Bank Polytechnic in London. And that's it, you know, I was ready to, to do a career in, in the construction industry. Which, uh, in, in a curious way, I found myself taking overseas jobs. Partly because I wanted to travel and partly because I spoke languages. I spoke Arabic fluently, so it was easy for me in those days. It was a big boom uh, in the building industry in the, in the Middle East, the oil boom. And, uh, and so it was easy to get good jobs. And uh, I started off with going to Oman. I were there for five years. Uh, eventually, I found myself in, in Saudi Arabia uh, on a very senior posting. I was 33 at the time. And quite frankly, minding my own business uh, in Egyptology. I mean, I had, it wasn't my thing at all. I had a, a vocation like everybody else. I got interested. I read books about the pyramids. But uh, that's about it. Uh, until, until, uh, as things happen. I call it my, uh, uh, although I don't, I don't compare myself to, to, uh, to Isaac Newton, I still call it the apple that fell on my head. And I'm a great believer that things occur all the time. Uh, but we just don't pay attention. Uh, everybody knows about the apple that fell on Newton's head. I don't know if it's a true story or not, but, but it, it typifies the, the reaction of one man who asked the right question, why did it fall? I, I happen to go to Egypt from Saudi Arabia to visit uh, my mother who was still living there and uh, I took a, a diversion before going to Alexandria I went to the Cairo Museum you know when you live in Egypt you just don't do these things you know it's, uh, tourists go and see the pyramids not the Egyptians <laughs> so it was an odd thing for me to do but uh, I don't know it's something took me there and, and uh, I c went into a room where they kept the uh, relics of the pyramid builders. It's very little, uh, as, as you may know, very little has been found of the, 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 the great pyramid builders. And there was on the wall a picture, a photograph, a, a very large photograph, taken by the Egyptian Air Force in the 1950s, which showed a direct overhead of the three pyramids of Giza. And uh, I recall I, I had, a, in those days, I'm, I'm talking 1981 here, 82, I can't remember the exact date, where, you know, there was no internet, there, there was no fax. I mean, you know, the fax were being introduced then, you know, so a diff very different world. And it sounds strange for us to say, you know, I was surprised to see an aerial photograph, but you didn't see aerial photographs 
commonly in those days, you know? uh, let alone satellite photographs. So to me, it was a novelty. I mean, I'd never seen them from the air that way. And uh, I had an old, well, now it's old, I had a, a nice Olympus camera with a black and white film in it, and I took a picture. And that was it, you know, I returned to Saudi Arabia, developed, and I had forgotten about it until I developed the film. And it just was one of those things. I, mean, I was surprised that I, nobody had raised that question, like Newton's question. I, I saw three pyramids, two very large ones. They were on a, clearly on a diagonal line. The, the, the base of the pyramid is a square. So you had two squares running along the diagonal. The third pyramid was much smaller, which in itself was intriguing, and offset to that line, to the, to the, to the east or left, left side. And that was it. You know, I asked the question, why did they do that? I, the, the question that first nagged me was why the third pyramid was smaller. You know, all I had read about from Egyptologists was that these kings who built pyramids were megalomaniacs and they, they, they mobilized their country and they were, you know, so why would the third builder advertise a smaller pyramid? Because it's called the small pyramid. I mean, you know, it's diminutive. You know, people who go and see the pyramids of Giza, they say, oh, two big ones, one small. It's not small, it's 65 meters high. But if you put it next to these giants that are 140 meters plus, then it does look small. I'll give you, I, I'm, I'm thinking of an analogy. I mean, I'm a rather tall guy. I'm, I'm slightly over six feet. But I have my nephew who, believe it or not, is seven feet four. He's a basketball player. And when I go next to him, I look small. I really look small. It's embarrassing. You know, I have pictures with him where he actually lifts me. So why would a pharaoh want to advertise that he was smaller? He, you know, so the explanation for the Egyptologists is they didn't have the resources. How did they know they didn't have the resources? He died early. That makes sense. How did he know he was going to die early when he started building his pyramid? Uh, and that kind of strange... It, it didn't make sense. And then I thought, how do you make it fit? I mean, how do you explain that there's a smaller pyramid there next to two big ones? And the only explanation that came to mind was that it wasn't an ego problem. You know, it wasn't built by a pharaoh who had resources problems or he didn't have the... he was going to die early or whatever. It was a plan. It, it didn't belong to an individual pharaoh. It was an overall plan, which seemed to be the case. You had a, a, a site with three monuments of the same design, two almost of equal size and a smaller one. It, it reeks of a plan, you know. Uh, so I thought, okay, that can explain it. It, it. It's not a smaller pharaoh or a weaker pharaoh. It's part of a plan and it had to be small. The question is, why did it have to be small? The answer was obviously in what is the significance of this monument. And that I agree. Uh, I agree with the Egyptologists, There's no doubt at all that they are religious monuments but religious in the context of the builders and you have to get into the context of the builders now one of the strange things about the Giza pyramids is that they're there you know, <laughs> they've been there for thousands of years but they're silent there is no inscriptions on them nor inside nor outside which in itself is another mystery. The, the, the ego maniac pharaohs who build those pyramids didn't bother to tell us that they build them. You know, it's, it's like, I, I always say, it's like me being a writer. You know, I, I, I mean, I'm not an egomaniac, but I'll get pretty upset if my publisher doesn't put my name on the cover. You know, it would, it, it would, it would upset me. So why would they build the pyramid and the pharaoh would say, well, where is my name? I'm for posterity, you know, to, to you build this giant monument and nobody knows it's me. You know, so again, this, this story that I was hearing from the Egyptologists did not fit. Although it's true that the pyramids of Giza, now in, 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 to put them in a context, they're from the fourth dynasty. 
which is dated roughly to about 2500 BC. Uh, the dynasty prior to, uh, sorry, the dynasty immediately to them, after them, the fifth dynasty, have built pyramids further south, a few kilometers further south. You can actually see them from here. But there's no question that when you see those fifth dynasty pyramids, it comes as a shock because you, you know, compared to the, to the massive and perfect fourth dynasty pyramids, these things are shoddy. You know, they're jerry building, I mean, they're really crumbling. I mean, some of them don't even look like pyramids. They're smaller, they're, they're built with, uh, in, look like in haste. But they contain texts. In contrast to the fourth dynasty pyramids, these things are full of text. I mean, they, they, they filled every inch of the inner chambers with texts. Great. Let's see what they say. And these are known as the pyramid texts. Now, I should say this about the pyramid texts. They're authentic. They're actually carved on their original monuments. They're not translations or interpretations. They are the real thing. They're the oldest religious texts in the world. Older than the Bible. Uh, strangely, they were, they, were, they, they, they were greatly ignored. Egyptologists found them boring. They found them too complex and, and superstitious and they just didn't bother with them. Uh, to me, immediately, as I, well, I had to get a copy of them. It was not an easy thing in those days. I was still living in Saudi Arabia. And to me, the minute you read those texts, the minute you look into those texts, it's very obvious. They're entirely to do with the desire of the king to go to the sky, to ascend to the sky, after he dies. It's full of statements. Now, of course, they're 5,000 years old. They were not meant for uh, you and me to read. They were very occult. They were very um, private. Uh, they probably were not to be seen by other than the king himself and the high priests. And they were sealed inside the pyramid. So, you know, no wonder they're, they're complicated. But there are, you know, there is a logical way to approach them. Now, there's been very good translations of them. And, uh, today, we, we have some excellent translations uh, since the 60s. They were discovered, by the way, in the 1880s. So prior to that, prior to that, Egyptians used to say the pyramids are mute, they don't speak, you know. Well, here they are, they were eloquently filled with, 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 with texts. And you can categorize them in, I've done this, I mean, what, what I did was take what I call direct statements. I mean, the king goes to the sky, that's no ambiguity, no? The king wants to become a star, you know, and so I put the, what was direct statements, then what I call second level, third level, where it finally gets very obscure, because they use metaphors that we don't know what they mean. Now, as an example, because, you know, we accept metaphors for granted when we know them. I mean, when we read uh, the New Testament, for example, you know, we say the, the Lamb of God uh, gave His blood. So if you don't know who the Lamb of God is, you, you really don't get it. So, you know, you've got to realize that they do use metaphors like this in these ancient texts. And there's a point where you have to abandon it. You just can't get through. But there is no doubt that when you read those texts, the king wants to go to the stars. He wants to become a star. He wants to join his father in the sky. He, he, they believed that they were, kings believed that they were the sons of Isis and Osiris, the, the original founders of their civilization. And that Osiris, after his death, became a constellation, the constellation that we call today Orion. And there he created a kingdom, if you like, for the dead, for the kings. And the kings wanted to join him there. <laughs> Basically, uh, today we would say it's impossible, we would, you know, un unless we build a starship and, you know, whatever. They didn't think like we do, and that's where you have to spend a lot of time with these texts. Now I'm jumping the gun here because I want to tell you how, what happened that led me to look into all this deeply. Now I stumbled, after my return from Egypt, I'm sort of catching back the trip, I stumbled on a passage of these texts. 
not a full translation. There was a friend of mine who had a coffee table book. And the luck of the gods would be that it mentioned the king wanting to go to the constellation of Orion. And it kind of stayed in my head. So I had this picture that I saw, you know, the pyramid, the little one offset, and then this statement. And on one occasion I was in the desert camping with, uh, with a group of friends and one of them, a French friend of mine, was a navigator. And that's again before the days of GPS and all this stuff. And he would use the stars. And he would, he explained to me, I mean, very bright sky on, on that particular night. And he said, you know, if you look at Orion, you see the central stars. Orion is like a rectangle, it's four bright stars. And in the middle is the famous belt, three stars. And he said, if you f draw a line backwards, you will pick the position of the rising of Sirius. Sirius is the brightest star in the northern hemisphere. Once you've got Sirius and you know it's bearing, that's it, you know where where to direct yourself. And then, just like that, it's one of those, that's where the apple came. You know, he looked again at the stars and he was a bit apologetic. He said, that, you know, I said they were in a row, but they're not in a row. There's the two bright ones are in a row and the little one on top is offset. And to me, he was saying the same thing that I was saying about the photograph of the pyramids. And knowing that there was a connection between the king's desire to go to the stars and the pyramids he built, you know, the penny dropped, I mean, you know, the, the apple dropped on my head. I got very excited, but I mean, it wasn't... At first I thought, you know, somebody must have noticed this. I mean, it's one of those strange things, you know. I'm, I'm sure, that I'll waste my time, you know. So I wrote to a few Egyptologists and it became very obvious that they had never heard of this. Uh, and I finally stumbled on uh, the late Professor Edwards, Sir Ivan Edwards, who was very interested. And he invited me to come and see him in, uh, when I had an opportunity to come to England, which I immediately thought, okay, why not? And the first holiday I had, I knocked on his door in, in Oxford, very sweet man, and he said, come in, you know, we talked about it. And he told me, something that I didn't know. He told me that indeed the Egyptologists had known of a direct connection not just with the texts but with the pyramids of Giza, with the Great Pyramid. That inside the king's chamber were shafts, narrow shafts, and one of them was had been worked out by Egyptologists and astronomers to have pointed to Orion's belt at the time of the construction of the pyramids. And I thought well, there you are, I mean, you know, what more do we want? You know, the, and as I got more into this subject, I discovered something else, which to me was utterly puzzling because the Egyptologists insisted that the kings who built those pyramids were following the sun cult, that they believed that the pyramids were solar symbols, that they represented the rays of the sun shining down or something like that or staircases leading into the sun. But as you read the pyramid text, it was very obvious that the king did not want to go to the sun. The sun was the sun god. He wanted to become a star. There's no question about it. On top of that, not the Giza pyramids, the, but there are pyramids of the same dynasty, one at Abu Ruash, built by the son of King Cheops, of the Great Pyramid, and one built by Pharaoh on the other side, north, just a few kilometers, a fourth dynasty pharaoh called Nebka. And here it was. The kings gave names to their pyramids. They identified themselves with the pyramid. They, 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 met, they saw themselves as themselves being part of the pyramid. And they named the pyramid. And they named them as a star. The, the one in Abu Ruash is called Jelifra, is a star. And the one in, uh, in uh, Zawit al Aryan is called Nebuchadnezzar Star. So what, what more do they want? The pyramids are identified as stars. The king wants to go to the stars of Orion. The, the, there is a shaft pointing to Orion's belt, and the pyramid on the ground looks like Orion's belt. I mean, it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck. It must be a duck. And so I thought, I'm going to publish this. And uh, I did. I mean, I eventually, through contact with Professor Edwards, I published a, uh, 
an article in uh, actually a series of articles in 1987 to 89 and that's it I mean I thought I've done my job you know I've, I've downloaded it from my mind and uh, let them do what they want to do with it but I wasn't satisfied I mean uh, nothing really happened um, a couple of letters here and there you know but that was it and I thought this is strange I mean this this, this thing is too important and you know I, it sounds strange for me to say this now but and I, I, I'm much older and I, I'm much more calmer about these things but uh, at the time it's hard to explain but I felt it was a kind of responsibility I just could not accept that I die and I wouldn't have brought this thing out you know it just bothered me and I had to do it you know I had to really push it and so well long story one thing led to another and eventually I uh, I found myself a publisher and by the luck of things um, at the time when I was about to get started with writing this book for a publisher uh, a German engineer, Rudolf Ganterbrake, explored the shafts uh, of the Great Pyramid and uh, he found a little door, it's a famous little door at the end of one of these shafts so there was big news about this and one, the whole thing took fire uh, it's, it, it's, 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 to me it was one of those huge uh, 360 degrees situation, I mean I, from one day to the next I became I became the star pyramid man you know <laughs> my life changed completely uh, I, I always remember this I, the, the, the BBC did a, a major documentary on it and I went the next day to London with my wife and we were visiting some friends and I stopped in Piccadilly Street and I wanted to buy some flowers and I, the, 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 the seller said, oh, you're the pyramid man. <laughs> and I thought, my God, you know, I mean, what have I done? You know, and it was overwhelming because uh, clearly I touched a nerve here, especially the way it was presented. I mean, of course, the BBC made it, exposed it. To, I mean, suddenly, you know, it was broadcasted on, on, on a major channel and uh, everybody saw it I mean and who didn't see it were told about it I mean every Egyptologist in the country was on their on, up in arms you know and suddenly I found myself uh, overwhelmed by this I mean uh, there was a lot of anger and uh, Egyptologists so and so in this newspaper were saying I was a charlatan and you know it went out of control for a while but I kept my nerves because it's, it's very unnerving I mean you know you're getting attacked by some very senior people some some heavyweights you know professors and deans and all but then I thought wait a minute you know uh, it makes sense <laughs> you know I don't care what they say you know now I use very different approaches I mean uh, you know they, they were the, 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 the experts were commenting you know they were and finally I said, well, wait a minute, I'm the expert. I'm, I'm the expert on this one, you know. Why should I be intimidated by the expert, you know. And frankly, they, they, were, they were coming up with very annoying criticism. Uh, first, they did the, uh, the personality thing. I mean, they, I, I wasn't an Egyptologist and uh, I didn't know what I was talking about. And, you know, he's a charlatan and, you know. Uh, believe me, I was called a lot of things. And there was some instance where it got very nasty. I mean, in Egypt, I was called an anti a Jewish supporter, a Zionist. And here I was called an anti Semitic for some reason. I don't know. It all went berserk. Uh, How did it end up having anything to do with the Jews? Well, here's the weird one is that the pyramids, there's, there was an old theory that the pyramids were built by the Jews in captivity. Yeah. Now, if you supported the theory, you were a Zionist, according to the Egyptians. If you didn't support the theory, to some you were anti-Semitic. But there you are, I mean, had people saying you're anti-Semitic, you know, you don't support them. It all came out because once you're exposed that way, you're, you're out there, you know, and anybody can take a pot shot at you. And in this case, the big guns came out. I mean, uh, it wasn't just the, the lunatic fringe taking pot shots. I mean, I had, uh, you know, heavyweights. I mean, I had the, 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 the Ministry of Tourism in Egypt, the Director of the Antiquities, you know. And, but things have, you know, I've, I've learned how to deal with this. You know, and 
the funny thing about this, I mean, I, I began to see, I mean, I was getting angry because I began to see that there was a kind of auto da fe here. I mean, the, the, not only they wanted my blood, but their arguments were, uh, were very um, almost inquisitional. I mean, uh, uh, strange arrogance that came out. I'm, I'm not saying in general. I mean, uh, there are some nice Egyptologists and some... But I was astounded. For example, this business about the door. You know, uh, there could be a chamber at the end of this shaft. Maybe there isn't, we don't know. But I had the German director of the German Archaeological Institute who was responsible for this exploration. And I remember sitting next to him with the BBC. And this man quite happily said, there is nothing behind this door. And I remember the BBC guy, you know, taking notes. And so I gave him a nudge. I said, ask him, how does he know? It didn't occur to him because it's funny how they don't, it doesn't occur to people to ask these authorities. They, they take them for granted. So I said, ask him how he knows there's nothing behind the door. And he said, why do you ask me? I said, well, I mean, how do you know there's nothing behind the door? And all he could say after getting green and red in the face was, because I am an expert. I <laughs> said, so, you know, I'm, I'm Professor so-and-so. So I said, so I'm good enough. So I began to see this kind of strange world that I thought academics were very broad-minded and liberal, but there was such a lot of backstabbing, a lot of um, uh, refusal when things were so obvious. So, you know, I use, I use phrases now like, you know, they can bring me a, a hundred Egyptologists if I'm concerned. You know, I, I tell them, it doesn't matter how many you bring. You know, truth is not democratic. You don't vote on truth, you know. If it's true, it's true, I'm sorry. You know, you can bring me a zillion professors. And that's, you know, and I, uh, there's a wonderful phrase by the, the Robert Schock, who also did a huge controversy over the age of the Sphinx. And he has a lovely one. I mean, he, he was once shouted uh, during a, a geological conference. He was shouted down. And one geologist was very angry and he stood up and he said, there is not a single Egyptologist who agrees with you. You are not following the professionals. And you know what he said? He had a lovely reply. He said, I do not follow the Egyptologist. I follow the science. That's what I follow. And the science tells me that the Sphinx is older. I'm not going to follow the Egyptologist. And that's, he's right. And there's a kind of, kind of arrogance that you find at this high level. It, it's, it's very disconcerting. But you must hold your ground, and it's the way it goes. You know, I mean, we know history, you know, Galileo and all the Darwin, you know, they, they, they got their fair share of this. Do you think they get very jealous when, when people like yourself appear in, in the print media? Yeah, I, you know, I don't even think it's jealousy. I think it's, they, they really truly begin to believe in their authority. And that's the danger. I mean, <clears throat> you know, it's like the Pope, you know, who, who believes in his authority. You know, until you challenge his authority. I mean, says, how do you know? You know, he'll tell are there, you. Are there any specific groups which have really taken up what you've discovered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Such as like well, Freemasons, for instance. Are they interested? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the public was widely interested in this, in, this, in this theory. It still is. I mean, it's a theory that uh, has become, <clears throat> well, almost a household name. I mean, I'm surprised sometimes. I mean, uh, I was renewing my passport at the, the Belgian consulate a few days ago. And as I walked in, and you know, and they saw my name, said, "Oh, you, you the pyramid with Orion." Now, they said the Orion thing. Now, because, uh, yeah, it is a huge interest because it it makes sense. I mean, I, I know this by experience. I mean, I've been in the business for a long time with this theory. You know, give me twelve people, give me a jury, and I am sure that if you present them the case, as I, it's very simple. You know, forget about Egyptologists, forget about me. You know, let's look at the facts. And if you look at the facts, you will know that the pyramids, especially the Giza pyramids, are astronomically aligned They're with high precision. They face the cardinal direction. So that alone should tell you that there is something to do with astronomy. The precision of the alignment is such that even the Egyptologists agree, you have to use stars can't do it with anything else. It has to be a pinpoint of light. Therefore, stars are 
related to the setting out of these monuments. And then you read that the king wants to go to the stars. And then you find that there is a shaft that pointed to the stars of Orion's belt. And the king wants to go to specific stars. And then you look at the picture and you say, well, you know, three stars, three pyramids, two large pyramids, one offset, small one, two st stars, two bright ones, one smaller one offset. You've got a correlation. And then you say, wait a minute, also the way the pyramids are in connection with the Nile, in relation to the Nile, these are the same. They're inclined the same way, they're proportionally the same distance. We, we've got a correlation here. The question is not whether we've got a correlation. The question is whether it is a coincidence. And the evidence that is backed is... Well, if it is, it's one of those incredible things. You know, it's, uh, it, it just doesn't fit the coincidence. The, the needle is going into the no coincidence side. It's just one of those. And let me tell you, I mean, uh, I've been with this thing for 25 years. It's not a coincidence. And, and, and to ignore it is, is, is to me, uh, 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 well, of course, gradually as the dust began to, to, to fall and they got, you know, the anger began to dissipate, some Egyptologists began to look at this. And uh, some are open, some at least talk about it. It's been discussed at universities. Uh, where it's be taken the right direction is when archaeoastronomers began to look at this. Because frankly, Egyptologists are not the right guys to look at this. You need to, to know some basic astronomy. You know, you need to understand about precession, for example. You need to understand why the stars look the way they do today and why they change. And so that was a problem. Now, my problem was that when you talk to an astronomer, he said, I don't know anything about Egyptology, so I won't talk about it. And when you talk to an Egyptologist, uh, he said, I don't know anything about astronomy, so I won't comment about it. So who's going to comment? You know, the angry guys were commenting. So eventually, we, there, there is now a profession. Uh, there, there are chairs at universities that blend the two. We call this archaeoastronomy. People who study archaeology and astronomy at the same time. Because why? It's not just the ancient Egyptians. All the ancient cultures looked at the sky and they have religions related to the sky, their monuments are aligned to the sky. So you definitely need the input of astronomy. To, to me it was very obvious that the minute you brought in the missing key, if you like, the minute you brought astronomy into the equation, it worked. If you're looking at the pyramid text without astronomy, to me it was like looking at the, like looking at the balance sheet of, of an accountant and refusing to say there are numbers. You know, if you don't understand numbers, then the, you, how can you read the balance sheet? There is a kind of problem in our culture. Uh, we have become uncomfortable with something that we should not be uncomfortable with. We, we're uncomfortable about the mystery of our existence. You know, scientists feel very uncomfortable. With this. They felt uncomfortable discussing my theory, which is a very logical theory. We're not talking about aliens here, we're not talking about paranormal, we're talking about people who wanted to design a cemetery representing that sky zone that they wanted to go. There's nothing crazy about it. In their mind, they were doing something else, of course. In their mind, they were, they were building some sort of spiritual machine, if you like, that was going to launch them there. But there's nothing crazy about it. And yet, they refused. They felt very uncomfortable about this. So if they feel uncomfortable about this, forget about talking about, you know, what we obviously all know we have. There is, there is a there is an unseen 
uh, aspect of our existence. You know, in fact, to be the way I at my age now, I realize that 90% of my existence is unseen. It's all going in here somewhere. There is a mystery. There's a great mystery, and we're part of it, and we really don't know. I mean, the, the other day I was. Uh, uh, a couple of months ago, I was invited to give a talk at the Theosophical Society. I'm kind of digressing here to, to answer your question because I went to, the, to give a talk at the Theosophical Society, I've got a very good friend, who you might be interested in, John Gordon. You know John Gordon? The writer. And tell you about him later. Anyway, John Gordon, who is, um, organizes these events, asked me to come and talk. I came from Spain, especially, to give a talk. And I decided to talk about the cosmology of the ancient Egyptians. <laughs> I remember I got an immediate reaction from a professional saying you shouldn't call it cosmology, you should call it cosmogony. And I said, why? He said, because it's a religious, you know, so, uh, subtle difference. Anyway, so I went to give the talk. And I started talking science. You know, and uh, they, they, they felt a bit strange. I was supposed to talk about the ancient Egyptians. And I tried to put everything in a context in something like five minutes. I'll, I'll try and do it for you here because we tend to forget this. The thing is that we have two errors here. One is that we are uncomfortable with what we think is the, you know, the wuji buji stuff, you know, the voodoo stuff, you know. But we shouldn't. We should feel, we sh on the contrary, we should feel at ease with this. The other is uh, the, the huge problem we have in our way of thinking is that we externalize the thinking. We think we're going to find the answer somewhere there. You know, the funny thing is that we have the answer. You know, we, we, we come, we are actually made <coughs> from the original source. It's true. You know, you, 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 that fragment that blew up 20 billion years ago is somewhere in you. A piece of it is in you. We're it. You know, and we forgot to internalize our search. I mean, the, the, the ancient sages, you were talking about the great masters, they internalized. And, and, and the reason they did, uh, luckily they didn't get born in our era because they would have been influenced and they wouldn't have done it. When you don't have a technology, when you don't have a scientific technology, but you have geniuses, you know, that's the funny thing about the, the when you study history, and, and ancient history and prehistory. You know, it's very annoying when you read that they were supposed to be primitives. There is no reason why they, there wasn't Einsteins and Newtons and geniuses. They were, but they didn't have the scientific technology. They had the same brain, and they used that brain to internalize. They tried to explain somehow their existence by searching inside. And for all we know, they probably arrived closer to the answers than we will with all our technology. So, to answer your question in a roundabout way, yes, I believe in the mystery and I believe that for some reason uh, I saw this thing. It's as if the king believed that he was going to return to the point of origin where it all started and rejoin his clan of gods. And I thought, wait a minute, what do you mean by this first time? He kept talking about a long time before when the god Osiris had established. And I thought, wait a minute, if they, if they speak of Osiris as being the stars, what would be the first time of these stars? And of course, it brought me to this idea of precession. There is a cycle of 26,000 years. What would constitute the beginning of such a cycle? And as you observe these stars, over that long-term cycle, we can do that with a computer. Uh, the, the, what seems obviously the beginning is when they're at their low, uh, at their, at their uh, nadir, if you like. And then they rise to the maximum and then they drop again on this cycle. So I thought, let's look at the beginning. Do they mean something? And I was stunned because as you brought them down, if you like, if you process the stars to the beginning, you arrived at a very strange date. You arrived at the date of 10,500 BC and all the bells began to ring here because there was the strange prophecies made by the, 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 the American seer, the other case in which I was, I'm not into that at all, but I thought how weird, I mean, you know, he, he, he guessed it, you know, 
And then I thought, wait a minute, why, let's look carefully at the sky. And I remember, it, it's, the, the software is such that I was looking due south, I was looking at the, the way the stars moved up and down in the cycle, and the software is such that if you press E you go east, if you press W you go west. And so for some reason I pressed E, so let's, let's see what happens east. And there it was, you know, floating over the east, precisely due east, was the constellation of Leo. Now I didn't need to be told anything because I knew that there was a monument that was a lion looking in that direction. And I thought this is too much, I mean it can't be, I mean it's, it's, it's very odd. I mean now we have two monuments, <coughs> two sets of monuments, the three pyramids, like Orion in the south and the Sphinx like Leo in the east, locking at the same time. So I phoned Graham Hancock, I said, you know, have a look at this. And uh, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll go to the grave on this one because it caused a hell of a lot of commotion. Because the Orion mystery already was causing a fuss, but at least it was within the dating that the Egyptian, the Egyptologists gave. But now when we started talking about 10,500 BC, they were not happy at all. But you see, the reason they were not happy is they couldn't simply poo-poo it. You know, the logic was, was incredibly clear here. You know, the Egyptians invite us to look at Orion, we look at Orion and then they invite us to look at the beginning of a cycle, we look at the beginning of a cycle and bang, look what you've got. It's pure logic, you know, there was nice, clear, straightforward logic. Of course, all the arguments, they didn't know Leo at the time and all this stuff, and, but it was there. And you see, <laughs> I don't see it like that too much nowadays, but uh, what was going on was suddenly we began to form a camp. You know, we were the alternative, you know, called an alternative historian. And they were the orthodox. And we realized we were battling, you know, we were, they, they were, they were, and, and we began to realize why they were angry, especially with me and Graham Hancock. They were angry because our arguments were solid, otherwise they wouldn't even bother, you know, and, and that's what got them angry, is that people would say, well, why do you say they're wrong? I mean, look at the logic, you know. So they got very, very angry and they just could not knock it, so they, at, at, at one stage we had them on, on the run, I can tell you, they were, until they sort of regrouped again <laughs> and then they became nasty, you know, they would go and fish around experts, you know, and, and they, they would have Professor so-and-so saying, you know, I've looked at this and this is rubbish, you know, but um, it was a strange situation, so... So are you kind of pointing out that the Sphinx was either built and... Well, again, well to answer your question, in, in, is, yeah, we, 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 f uh, we wrote another book, and we wrote a book called Keeper of Genesis, which was all about this idea that there was a correlation. If you reconstructed the sky at what you could interpret as the first time that the Egyptians spoke of in the text, this first time of Orion or Osiris, then you had a Cinderella fit, you know, the, the, the slipper fitted, this pyramid slipper fitted perfectly and it, it, to me it's just one of those, I mean uh, that's it, I mean so they said well how do you explain this, I mean you know okay, it, okay we see it but there was no Egyptians in 10,000 years ago, you know there was you know there's no evidence of a culture, there's no evidence, where, where, where are the pot shards, where are, where the, where are the monuments, you know where, so it's true there was no evidence and for a while it was a theory, for a long time it was a theory, until now. <laughs> and then everything is changing now because the evidence is coming out strong, hard, solid, stone evidence. And in a place where we didn't expect it at all, where I wasn't looking at all. And that is the Egyptian Sahara, the western desert of Egypt. One has to see this thing in its chronological events. I mean, there, 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 was, there was theories. There was a theory about the correlation, 
which was astronomy. There was a theory about the correlation bringing the Sphinx in, the dating, and then there was the geological arguments brought by Robert Schock, John West. Uh, but uh, although they caused one hell of a commotion, they caused a lot of discussion, a lot of anger, uh, what was always the weak point for the uh, orthodoxy was, okay, they're very nice theories, but where is the evidence? I mean, we want to see. And uh, it was annoying. You know, and of course we said, but it's not our problem. I mean, you know, we, we, everything suggests that there was activity going on in this remote period, you know, 10,000 BC, 12,000 BC. It's not our job to look at the evidence. You know, they're evidence-driven, they're, 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 they're evidence and the evidence in archaeology has to be... Now we were using a different word, by the way. It's become more and more accepted in, in, in archaeological circles to talk about non-tangible evidence. Because there are, there's a lot of evidence that is very convincing, but it's not, you can't touch it. You know, you can't touch astronomy. You know, but it exists. You can't touch religion, you know, but it exists. So it became very annoying with the archaeologists that they would insist on tangible evidence. Because that's how they do it. You know, they, they, they dig on the floor and if they find something and if they don't, it's not there. So now, it's, it's, it's a new term by the way, it's being used quite a lot in archaeology. We talk about non-tangible evidence. For example, if there are two monuments of different dates, but they exhibit the same alignments, astronomical alignments, uh, to the same stars and so forth, then there is a link. It's not tangible, you know, you, you don't find the artifacts, but the link is obvious. And therefore, a, a lot of blockage used to happen because they would not consider this evidence, so we couldn't move. You know, but well now they, 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 we tend to move, because you've got to move once you find something that is leading the argument in a direction. So, <clears throat> the evidence was non-tangible. It was a good theories, it made a lot of sense, but they could not find this evidence. And it became very annoying. Every time there was a discussion, where is it? You know. Until, until 1974. Now, strangely, our arguments were heated up in the, in the 90s. But we hadn't heard of this. It hadn't become clear. Anthropologists from America and from Poland stumbled on a prehistoric site in the Sahara. There was a lot of these prehistoric sites, I mean, the Sahara is full of them. But they stumbled on a very weird one, a hundred kilometers west of Abu Simbel. Uh, they named it the Napta Playa. What was strange about this site is that it seemed to be not a usual settlement that they used to find, you know, just remains of stone huts and, 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 and flints and, and stone articles. What was strange about this site is that it didn't have anything of, the, it had some of this stuff, but the main stuff that it had was large boulders in strange patterns. It looked like some sort of ceremonial site. The, the centerpiece of this is, is a stone circle. Uh, we call it the, uh, the sort of Stonehenge of the desert. Uh, it operates like a can. And they found it almost intact. The strange thing about this site is that the people who were there just left it. And it was untouched for thousands of years. We know for sure that it <coughs> existed in long, long before the pyramid because of the carbon dating that has been done. We know that the people who were there, whoever they were, were there from about eight to 9,000 BC. And they remained there till about 3,500 BC. It's a huge period of time. There is three main elements in this site. One of them is the stone circle. I want to see it many times. It's not very big. It's about the size of this room. The stones are about this height. And <coughs> it's, it's amazing. You, you're looking at something that was put there about seven, eight thousand years ago. Then there are strange conglomeration of rocks, clearly placed by human hands, they're not natural. One of them 
is a, obviously the main one, it's a, it's a much larger conglomeration, and from it shoots out alignments of stones, like spokes of a, of a bicycle wheel. Yeah? Several of them shoot north, several of them shoot east. The Egyptologists didn't pay much attention to this. I mean, they, 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 they studied it like a normal prehistoric site. They started digging, they started studying the, the, the flints and all this business. Until one of them said, well, you know, what do they mean, all this stuff? And they had a hunch, it's something to do with the horizon. And of course they knew that <coughs> the Egyptians of later times practiced this kind of rituals. So they brought an astronomer on the site, a fellow called Kim Malville from Boulder, Colorado. And he immediately noticed, you know, it didn't take him long to realize that there was alignments to the solstices from the stone circle, alignments to the meridian. But it got very intriguing when he looked at the alignments of these spokes, these long rows, they, they go about five, six hundred meters. He concluded, and here's the weird one, he concluded that the alignments in the east pointed to Orion's belt and to Sirius, and he concluded that the alignments in the north pointed to the plow. These are the three constellations that the pyramid builders used. And suddenly there was a shockwave. You know, it's a bit like the, um, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, the, we, we, you know, suddenly we had a shock because what we thought was original to the, to the Old Testament, to the New Testament, was not. There was phrases verbatim from previous times. So there we were, I mean, you know, weird. What was even weirder is that there's a third element on this side which are tumuli, large igloo shaped uh, conglomeration of stones and when they started digging these in some of them they found buried the remains of cows they were clearly ceremonial there were cows positioned uh, to face all the same direction there was a few beads around them they buried cows clearly and, yeah it's very strange what became even stranger is when they start digging some other of these stimuli and they find cows they found even stranger thing. They found that these people, whoever they were, buried huge boulders, single piece boulders, about three, four tons a piece. They went to the trouble of dragging these boulders from a long distance. They would dig a hole about six meters deep and they would cover it. They were totally baffled. I mean, they were totally baffled. Clearly, it was cer ceremonial. But the, the ceremonies were astronomical literally looking at the stars and the sun and the very same stars, you know, Orion's belt, Sirius and the plow. Better still, they had been there for thousands of years and the astronomer Malver concluded they weren't just watching the stars, they were tracking them because the lines changed direction as the stars moved with precession. These people were doing precession <laughs> and observing precession and tracking it for thousands of years before the pharaohs. So there was something else. Now what were the cows doing there? You know, we thought cows were not domesticated, they were domesticated in Asia. These guys had cows. And clearly they had domesticated their cows. Now here's the story of what we know now. In prehistoric times, we're talking about 20, 30,000 years ago, the Sahara was fertile. It had, it had periods of aridity and periods of fertility. When it was fertile, the reason it was fertile is because of the climatic <coughs> conditions, especially before the Ice Age. As the Ice Age began to break, caused tremendous weather shifts, and in Central Africa, the monsoons that still happen today were very violent. And they would cause this, they still do, they cause the Nile flood every year, you know that the Nile floods every year in, 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 in summertime. But the floods were gigantic. Nobody could live in the Nile Valley. I mean, it was, it was, a, it was a swamp and, and, and dangerous. You know, these floods would come and wreck everything. Whereas the opposite was in the Sahara, because the monsoon would push their way northwards and they would reach the southern part of Egypt. They would pass Sudan and, and rain where today is Abu Simbel and the kind of places which there's no rain today. And what, they would, what would happen is that during a two, three weeks period, they would drench the Sahara and in the depressions, of course, they would form temporary lakes. This beautiful pastoral field, you know. Now, 
because of that, the Normans of the area, now we don't know where they came from, but there's a very strong case now that they came from the Tibesti Mountains in the, in the Chad, a long, long time ago. They were black people, they, were, they, they looked like Maasai, it's very, very slender, very beautiful black people. We don't know when they came, maybe 20, 30,000 years ago. Something drove them into what is today the Sahara. And they settled in certain regions and they would hunt like they... Except when the aridity of the desert began to form, in these periods of aridity, they were forced to move because water was scarce and when their lakes were dry, they would try and find lakes that still had water. So they were obliged to move. And now, oh, we all agree, I mean the anthropologists agree, even Egyptologists are forced to agree, <coughs> because they were forced to move, they had to find a way how to navigate. Not only that, they had to carry their food, distances are enormous. And that's forced them, rather than to hunt, to somehow find a way to take their beasts. And they began to domesticate animals, cows, uh, goats. So they would literally have walking fridges, if you like, walking larders. And they would, they would not kill these animals, they would drink the milk, they would drink the blood, like the Maasai do. In fact, we still have remnants of these people who are still pastoralists. But these pastoralists that still exist in Africa stayed pastoralists. Whereas the ones in the Sahara, because they were forced to do certain things, they were forced to move and therefore they were forced to domesticate cattle very early and they were forced to learn about the stars, to navigate. Like we were forced to learn about the stars when we navigated before the, the invention of the clock and before the invention of radars. We were literally forced to do that, otherwise you get lost. So they began to study the sky and that led them to not only to move, to navigate, but they had to time the navigation. They had to, the, the, when you travel in the Sahara today, you, it's not so obvious to people who haven't done it, but the most vital thing is when you get to where you want to get, that you find water there. You don't find water in serious trouble unless you've carried it. You can't take the risk of going somewhere at a well, and if the well is dry, you've had it. And in those days, they would travel for months.